Amen. Boy, isn't that the truth? It's, uh, it's sad that uh, oftentimes when, when people turn their back on the Lord, and uh, it, it's for a moment, right? The devil, the devil puts something out there for you and says, you know, it's not worth serving God. And uh, it, uh, you're missing out on this. And if we're not careful, if we're not walking with the Lord, then in our flesh we'll submit to that and for a moment, right? The Bible's clear. There is a pleasure, right, in sin for a season. And so I just uh, uh, finished up a book this week, and uh, uh, it was a very good book. And one of the, one of the themes is, w- about it was this. It was talking about changing habits and, and different things of that. And uh, our human nature is we're, we're not real good at uh, deferring pleasure, right? So whatever it is that uh, we think can, can make us feel good now or, or meet a need or a desire now, we'll say, okay, well, we'll do that now and we'll deal with the consequences later. The problem with that is once you start down that road, right, uh, the end result gets there a lot quicker than you think it will, right? And, and so we see that in a lot of different areas. And uh, really in Proverbs 23, that's where we'll be tonight. If you can turn over there in your Bible, if you have it tonight. Proverbs 23, we want to begin in verse number 1. So if you're able to, let's stand together. And if you're not, you remain seated. The Bible said when, in verse 1 of uh, chapter 23, when thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. That's pretty good advice. And put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Well, that seems kind of drastic, doesn't it? Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Well, that's interesting too, because it seems like everywhere you turn today, it's the reason you work is what? To earn money. And you want to earn more money. And so if this guy offers you more money, you need to get all the money you can because you need to buy these certain things and you need a better life. And the only way you have a better life is to buy newer and bigger things. And so, But the Bible said here that we're not to labor to be rich. Right. Wilt thou set thine eyes, in verse 5, upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. And the morsel which thou hast eaten, shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. And speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. That's again interesting to me because the very people that need wisdom are the foolish. The Bible tells us here that save your breath, right? Because if they're not ready to receive wisdom, then you are, you're not going, they're, they're not going to receive what you give them. And so uh, the Bible says in verse 10, Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. For their Redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with them. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Now here's this one's going to sting a little bit. Verse 13, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Amen. Boy, all the parents like that one. Amen. <laughs> all the kids are going, whoa, wait a minute. All the parents are going, what? Sounds good to me, right? Thou shalt beat him, verse 14, with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth and Lord, even though our flesh oftentimes does not want to hear it, uh, please just give us a heart for it, I pray. God, speak to our hearts tonight, and Lord, we'll give you all the honor, praise, and glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You can be seated. So, you know, it's interesting to me when uh, people talk, and they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I want somebody, uh, I want to go to church where they preach the Bible but I want it to be practical, right? We, we, we think doctrine oftentimes is impractical. And so we'll say, well, I, I want a message that's practical. And then we'll get into a book like Proverbs, which is basically every verse is practical. And we'll say, well, 
I'm kind of bored with doing verse by verse uh, expository preaching. So, uh, you know, it, we never, we're never satisfied, are we? And so here in Proverbs, Solomon is writing to those he had authority over about them. And he's writing again to his son. And I, again, I find it interesting that I mentioned it when we first started studying Proverbs that Solomon is not only writing from uh, his experience and his wisdom. Think about his mom and dad. He's David's son. He was in uh, the house of uh, a man that God says he's a man after God's own heart. So he had all these great examples, all these experiences. Uh, he is uh, the wisest man that's ever walked the face of the earth, right? Uh, he asked God uh, for wisdom. God gave it to him. And so now he's passing all this on to his son. And you would think, right, you would think that if his granddaddy was David and his dad is Solomon, that he would sit at the feet of Solomon and say, just give me all you can, I want it all, right? right. But we know, just like us, we, we come and we hear the Bible and we know it's God's word and we know it's right and we know it's good for us. Yeah. But how often do we reject the word of God, right? Because it's not what we want to hear. Right. And so here Solomon is uh, uh, writing about those he had authority over. And again, he's passing this on to his son, uh, assuming that his son will take the... Uh, the, the reigns one day and he addresses wise words to his subject. Now, uh, again, you, you're seeing a shift in, uh, in leadership. And what I mean by that is years and years and years have gone by in the business world and the, the boss, the CEO, was the guy who was in the corner office that he ruled with a, a hand of iron and, and what he said goes and that's all that matters. Now you're seeing a shift into servant leadership where they're saying, you know, you gotta, you got to be a good leader. you got to lead by example. And we know that's what the Bible teaches us, and that's what Solomon is telling his son, that even though you'll have authority over these people, it is your responsibility to take care of them. And, and that's the way it is with any leadership. Dads, may I say this, you are the leader of the home, and so it's therefore it's your responsibility to take care of your home above all else. And my, uh, ladies, uh, you're the mother. It is your responsibility to take care of the children. And uh, as a pastor, it's my responsibility to take care of the, the church and be the under-shepherd of the flock. And so life is full of contradictions and contingencies. We, we think, well, you know, uh, the world teaches one thing and God teaches another thing. And I'd say this, if you want to have a profitable and successful and a, 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 a peaceful life, then we have to do it God's way. And so it seems Solomon goes from here to there in his thoughts. It doesn't seem like he stays in one direction, but understand this, that it's all tied together with his desire to give wisdom. Sometimes as, if you read scripture, read the gospels and, and read some of the epistles and you're, you're looking at things and you're going, this doesn't make sense to me. How this is put here and God puts this here and it doesn't seem like they go together. But here's what I would say. One thing is you have to read scripture in context and we have to read it with a historical mindset. In other words, that the letter was written to a certain church and we profit from it today. And so uh, it's all tied together with his desire to give wisdom. And so give wise words is our responsibility to those we have the responsibility to lead. And, and we learn that in this scripture. And two things I see and I'll give you tonight is number one, uh, Solomon is writing in verses 1 through 8 about the king's table. Now, he must have known he was going to write to Baptist one day because, again, anytime we do anything as Baptist, there has to be food involved, doesn't it? So he says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. In other words, I, I'm amazed, Brother Russell, at how, um, how blind, willfully blind, God's people are. Really, how willfully blind people in general are. It's like we're, we're, we, we stopped observing things, right? And, and, and we're taught to observe, observe, observe. And here it says consider, right? When thou sittest down to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. So it's, it, we have to survey what's going on. And, and so here at the king's table, it says uh, Solomon is warning in, uh, to beware of motives. Notice in verse 2, and put a, he says, Consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Well, that's interesting to me, because it, it, what he's saying is we need to cultivate awareness. Well, Johnny, it, it's, it's amazing to me how 
unaware people are, right? And, and, and Satan has so many distractions for us to, to get our minds off of the things of God. And, and I, you ever just walk down the street? I, was, we were, I, I don't know if we were walking down the street or in a store the other day. And some young man just about ran over me. You know why? Because he was... Now, if I were a thief, man, I'd have a heyday, wouldn't you? Because nobody's aware of anything going on. It's just this, right? And so we're, we're, we're in a day where we're very unaware of what's going on. We, we, we look at the news, we're not aware of what's going on. Right, we we live in a day we're unaware of what's going on uh, in in the in the the spiritual realm, and so we need to be aware of motives. And here he's saying we need to cultivate awareness. In other words, consider diligently what is before thee, and be aware that everything and everyone is not as they seem. Everything is not evident without observing. Right. Some things are too good to be true. I, I'm interested just, uh, what was it, a few weeks ago, this FTX cryptocurrency guy. He, he, he basically robbed people of billions of dollars. Now just me, I know you can't judge a book by its cover, but Brother Paul, looking at that dude, I wouldn't give him a dollar. I, I would, he wouldn't have got millions, well, I don't have millions, but he wouldn't have got millions, my, he wouldn't have got a dollar for me because he, he looked like a joke, amen? I mean, you know, I, I see people say, well, it's not how you dress, but I guarantee you this, I'm not going to give that guy any money to invest for my future, amen. right? Amen. And, and so what I'm saying is it, it was too good to be true. It was He was guaranteeing all these returns. Bernie Madoff years ago guaranteed all these returns. What, you better investigate things is what he's saying. And, and so we're, a wise man is aware of his surroundings and though he come, those he comes in contact with. You know, it's interesting to me, every political cycle, you know what happens? Well, here's what I'm going to do for you. Here's what I'm going to change. Here's what I promise. And, and, and they even say this, Brother Shane, they'll say, well, that was, the, that was the campaign promises and, and he knew when he got in office that here's the reality of it. So what you're saying is because there's two different sides to this thing, it, it's permissible to lie to get what you want, but then when you get in, you don't have to do what you say you're going to do. But we make that excuse for everything, don't we? And, and so... We have to cultivate awareness. But then in verse 2, notice the Bible said, Put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Amen. Well, that's interesting to me. Because the appetite is what drives us. Right? right? Here's what he's saying. Someone who has an appetite for popularity acceptance, right, will do just about anything to be accepted. When you look at your young people, moms and dads, and you look at who they're involved with and you're going, I don't understand why they're involved with them. I don't understand why they want to be friends with them. Well, because what they're seeking is acceptance. And they'll do just about anything if this particular group that they want to be a part of says do this and they feel like they'll be accepted, they'll just jump in and do it. But guess what? Adults are no different. Come on, pray right. You have somebody, let's be honest, they'll come to church, sit in the pew, they'll sing the songs, they'll say they're saved, they'll go to work, be around people that, that use profanity, tell things they shouldn't tell. Guess what they'll do? They'll jump right in. Why? Because they don't want to be the outcast. It takes, it takes someone who has a lot of courage and character to stand up in the face of people that are not like you. What drives us is our appetite, right? I mean, let's be honest. When someone gets hungry physically, they'll do anything they got to do to, to, right? I mean, I, let's be honest, we don't want to be hungry. We start getting a little bit of grumbling, and we'll cut people off, right? We, we'll run through the front gate of uh, Chick-fil-A, and, you know, I mean... It, 
People get hungry, they do crazy things. But that it's talking about more than a physical appetite. Whatever your appetite is, if it's for power, you know what? They'll do, people do anything for power. Prestige, they'll do anything for prestige. How, how many folks who wanted to be a, a movie star yes. sold their soul to be a movie yes, star? Right? right? Amen. You're right. That's good. And what Solomon is saying is when, when we have that appetite, whatever it is that drives us, we have to be aware that if we're not disciplined, we will do things to satisfy that appetite. God created us with certain appetites. But he also gave us the, gave us the, perfect, uh, the perfect remedy for that appetite. The, the natural appetite that a man and woman has, he, he, he gives the bond of marriage for that. And Satan has perverted all that. And so here he's saying, listen, it's better for you to put a knife to your throat than to be given the appetite. And so we have to be careful. You know what's amazing? People that want to, that want you know, they'll, they'll look at someone who is wealthy and they have all the toys and they have all this money and they'll say, boy, I'll tell you what, I wish I had that. And if you're not careful, that appetite for that, you know what happens? You'll do things that are immoral and against what you know to be right to do that. And I'm not just saying in that area. In every area that you have an appetite, if you don't learn to control that, so a man that is guided by appetite is headed for destruction. Yes. So Solomon goes on to say this. We need to be, beware of motives but also beware of materialism. Yes, sir. Verse 4 says, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Will thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. Yes, is, that, is that right? I don't really know how your retirement plan's been doing over the last couple years, but mine's grown wings. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. Let's be honest, brother Bobby. When I, I was telling Luke one day, we were talking about things. He's like, you know, Dave, you just don't know what it's like being married and getting started with inflation. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Because I made nine dollars an hour. That's right. and that was good money, That's right? right? Amen. Not twenty some dollars an hour. Right. But you look now. But I do know this. Guess what? Stuff didn't cost then what it does now. So you look at this amount of money, and let's be honest. I mean, one of the things as you think about retirement, if you can, which most of us obviously cannot now, right? One of the things you've got to guard against is what? Inflation, right? You, I'm, I'm guaranteed to have this much money every month and coming in, or, and guess what? But if inflation goes up this amount, it cuts in That's to right. that. Right. Things happen. Gas goes up, right? You lose your job. You have a physical ailment where you can't work and everything that you work for, guess what's gone? They tell you a pandemic comes and you cannot go to work. Gone, right? So, so Solomon's saying, listen, you, you can't put your trust in that because it can be gone like that. One, you don't believe me? When Brother Jimmy gets back, ask him what his hospital bill would be. Right? So we had better be real careful and beware of material. And there's nothing wrong with having stuff. The problem is most people's stuff has them. Right. That's good. Right. Amen. So the desire of riches, we're not got to be guided by human wisdom which places a priority on success. Interesting to me, I read a, a statistic where I think 30 to 40% uh, professional athletes are bankrupt or on the verge of bankrupt by the time they end their career. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not sure how you can spend $300 million, but it can be done, obviously, right? You say, well, if I had that kind of money, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd be fine. Well, somebody's looking at your bank account and saying, if I had what you had, I'd be fine, right? 
And so we have to realize that riches are temporal and can be gained or, or lost rapidly. And then he goes on to say, deal with the deceitfulness of riches. Riches fade. Let's be honest, you can never get enough to be satisfied if that's what you're laboring for. There's always more, more, more. So we're to live for the next world, not this one. That's, that's, that's you know, we talk about missions. Listen, you know why I bring that before you? It's, it's not so we can go around and brag about how many missionaries we have. It's because when you give to missions and souls are saved... That goes to your account. When you stand before God and God says, I gave you this to further my kingdom, and you said, yeah, but I wanted a new house, or I wanted a new Apple Watch or a new iPhone or whatever it is, and God said, I gave that to you for this purpose, and we we're not good stewards of what God gives us, guess what? It's not going to matter in heaven. Nobody's going to care in heaven. What's your bank account look like or mine? So we're to live for the next one. We just did Brother Johnny Page's funeral. We're getting ready to do Miss Barker's funeral. I got a call today. Probably going to be doing another funeral in the next couple weeks. So what I'm saying is, wherever you are in life, you need to realize that every day that you live, you're getting closer to eternity. And so we better be laying up treasures over there instead of leaving them down here. Then he deals with this in verse 6 through 8. He says, we're to beware of meanness. What do you mean by that, preacher? Look what he said. Eat thou not bread, the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meat, for he... Uh, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shall thou vomit up and, thou, th- and lose thy sweet word. So here, here's what he's saying. We need to be aware of those invitations from people that are evil. Now, again, I understand this. The fact is we're to stay clear of those who are wicked. There's something in our flesh that if someone is wicked but they're powerful or they're popular or they're whatever and they give an invitation, it's like, oh, well, you know. There's something in us. And it's that appetite. So all this is going together. When we look at this, we're often Satan will use these people to trap us. Why? Brother Matt, because we're not aware of what's going on, right? We're, we're, we're unaware. We're, we're caught up. And so, listen, there, there's so many distractions today. I mean, everywhere you turn, distractions. And so Solomon's, because he knew his son. He knew his son, how he was, that he would be easily drawn into the wrong crowd. You probably know your kid better than they know themselves, right? And often you over and over say, be careful. Be careful who you hang around with. You either are or soon will become what? Like the people you hang around. And so Solomon is warning his son that when evil men invite you, when evil men are trying to attract you, when evil men are trying to, to lure you in, that we're to be aware of their invitation and beware of the insincerity. The Bible said we're to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. I'm amazed at how naive people are. Well, Johnny, it's amazing to me how many men get caught up in, in immoral relationships with women who say they're saved and love God and they go, I don't know what happened. You do know what happened. We didn't adhere to the word of God. We're to abstain from the very appearance of evil, right? We're, we're to remove ourselves from situations. And, and so what I'm saying is we need to be very careful when we have invitations and we need to be very careful, uh, beware of insincerities because Satan can use anybody anytime to, to tarnish our testimony. And then finally... Verse 9 through 14, Solomon's dealing with 
a king's talk. Notice what he says in verse 9. Speak not in the ears of a fool. I said before, those are typically the people we think need to hear it the most, don't we? Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Interesting in it because I would almost guarantee when I read that somebody popped in your mind that you said they ought to be here tonight. Or Sunday morning somebody popped in your mind and said I sure wish so and so was here in church today. They need to be in church. And you've invited them and you've talked to them probably a family member and you have probably gone overboard and I miss you at church, and I miss you at church, and oh, I'd really wish you were there, and if it wasn't for, you know, your granddad would be so disappointed, and your mom would be so disappointed, and on and on and on. You just need to realize this. You just need to pray for them because they're not ready to hear what you're right. giving them. Right. Yes, sir. How many times you preach the gospel, and people come up, they'll say, man, I'll tell you what, if there was a lost person in service today and they didn't get saved, I don't know what's wrong with them. Let me ask you this, how many times did you sit in the service, right. hear the gospel preached and said no? Right. Until right. someone is ready to hear yes. wisdom, yes. they won't hear it, right? right? right. Till, that, till they realize that their, their pride is what is keeping them from uh, a walk with God. You save your breath. Yes. So trying to give wisdom and advice to a fool is a waste of time. That's why you need to pray for Brother Paul and Miss Tammy because usually at that age they don't want to hear anything. <laughs> Brother Paul's probably thinking, yeah, there's a lot of times when I'm teaching Sunday school, I look at them and they don't want to hear what I have to say. Right. It breaks our heart. Yes. But oftentimes we do more harm yes. than we do good. By constantly giving advice. So we have to have wisdom. Then he says, deals with the fatherless in verse 10 11. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the field of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. And again, I think I mentioned it maybe last week that those landmarks were important because God gave the children of Israel land and the different tribes land and they handed them out. Those landmarks were set up to prove whose land they were and so what would happen is someone would take the landmark they'd move it over a little bit. They'd move it over a little bit. Well, here's the problem. They may cheat, but God's the one keeping record. And so remove not the old landmark, enter not into the field of the fatherless. It would be real easy for someone who did not have a father or a male figure in the house to protect to say, well, you know what, we'll just go and overrun that, right? We'll, we'll take it over and, and uh, we'll take advantage of the widow and we'll take advantage of the fatherless. But understand this, that when we look at that, God holds a special interest in helpless people. You better be careful when you take advantage of people. Well, I, I can pull this over on them because they won't know. Well, God knows, right? Yes. Yes. See, see, that's, that's the difference. Amen. Solomon wanted to take care of people, and he knew his son would be the type of person that would take advantage of them. Yes. And I see that all the time. I see it with Christian people sometimes. Well, you know what? If they don't ask, I won't tell them. Well, uh, they didn't specifically say this, or they didn't sign this contract this way. Can I say this? If you say you're saved, love Jesus, you ought to act with character. Amen. Even if you don't have a contract, if you give someone your word, you ought to do it, right? It shouldn't have to be written down. It should be my word. Let my yeas be yea and my nays be nay. Amen? So here he's saying do not take advantage or hurt them in any way. It's something about kids, isn't it? God looks after widows and the fatherless. As a matter of fact, he said for, in verse 11, for their Redeemer is mighty. Uh-oh. He shall plead their cause with these. Now, I don't know. It's one thing if I plead the cause. But he's saying he, he'll plead their cause. I don't know about you. I don't want him not on my side. 
I want him on my side, right? Now, again, we have to be careful with this. Because we have to realize that the dichotomy of everything, the contrast, right, is that those that are widows and fatherless should be taken care of. Those that are lazy shouldn't. Amen. Right? You don't work? I said, well, I don't agree with that. Well, you take it up with the author, That's right? right? Amen. The Bible said a man that does not provide for his family is worse than an infidel. Right. But there are those that can't help it. They're helpless. And so we ought to protect them. Good. We ought to take care of them because God said he would. Yes, right. And so Solomon said, listen, don't, don't mess with the fatherless. Good. Don't try to take their property. Right. Right? Right. Don't, don't look for some loophole so you can take advantage and get more because yes. God's the one keeping up with it. Yes, now, I don't know about you. I don't want to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. God whipped me because I didn't handle things right. You might get away with it down here, but you won't up there. And so he talks about the fool. We've got to be careful. We can't offer wisdom to people that are not ready for it. But he also says we need to take care of the fatherless. And then he deals with the family in verses 12 through 14. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the word of knowledge. Hmm. It's interesting that he deals with the heart before the ear. God deals with the heart. Faith cometh by hearing, right? We hear, but God deals with the heart. Our belief determines our behavior. Now we say what we believe, Brother Eddie. We say, well, I believe this, but does your behavior really prove what you say you believe? If you believe that church is important, right, you'll come to church. If you think believe reading your Bible is important, you'll read your Bible. If you believe prayer uh, works, then you'll pray. If you believe in missions, you'll give to missions. If you believe Jesus is coming back, uh, we'll prepare for him to come back. If you believe outreach is important, winning people to Christ, guess what? You'll tell others about Jesus. So we can say all that we want to say with our mouth, but what's in our heart will eventually come out in our behavior, Right? And so, allow wisdom to penetrate the heart, not just facts in the mind. I think a lot of people have this book right here, and they can quote scripture, and they, they, intellectually they believe it, right? And, and the difference is, you'll, here's an example. You'll talk to people and they'll say, well, I, I believe Jesus died on the cross. Really? You believe in the fact that that happened? But you don't believe he's God in flesh. You don't believe that him dying on the cross paid for your sins. You don't believe that being a Christian means that uh, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You have an intellectual knowledge, but you've not embraced it in your heart. Well, what do you mean? If you believed it, it would change you. So, Brother Shane, all this, all this... Rhetoric that we've spewed for so long about this. Well, when I when I was a kid, I said this prayer and asked Jesus to be my asked him into my heart. But I'm just away from God. Okay? What's that mean? I'm I'm backslid. Thirty years? So you you can you can go out. Do anything you want to. There's no chastening. Hello. Well, see, we we we've we've put that out there for so long. Once saved, always saved. And and again, nobody believes in eternal security any more than I do. But I believe we've we've put this out there that all you got to do is say this little prayer. And there's no change. If the Holy Spirit resides in you, which is what happens at salvation, there's a change. 
There's something's different, right? It, it's not this intellectual knowledge. It is a it is a indwelling of the, the person of the Holy Spirit of God which changes our nature. Now we still have a flesh, right? But we, we have the nature of God in us. Now I'm not talking about losing anything. I'm saying, listen, good chance you never got it. So when, when we look at this and, and we say, well, you know, I, I believe the Word of God. I believe this is the Bible and I believe God's. Then, then let me ask you this. Why do we always make exceptions to it? If it's, if it's God's word and it's perfect, if it's inspired, which means God breathed, it's preserved, right? It, it's in, infallible. There's no mistakes in it. If that's what we believe, then we wouldn't be sifting through it trying to figure out how we can skirt around it all the time. And so... Not just enough to hear it. The Bible said here we need to apply thine heart unto instruction, thine ears to the word of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him uh, with the rod, he shall not die. Now, we like that, right? I mean, let's be honest, that's contrary to popular opinion in 2023. 2023 is let your kid do whatever they want to. They don't like what gender they are. Let them choose what they want to and do whatever, you know. They can't make a decision on, you know, whether to, whether to smoke cigarettes or not at age five. But they got enough sense to figure out what gender they should be, right? Can't get a driver's license because we can't trust them to drive a car. But making a life-changing decision that... Cannot be reversed. Right? Aren't you, th- aren't you thankful that some of you tomboys, they, you didn't have that option? Because there, there, we, had, we had a girl in our neighborhood. Now, uh, Brother Russell, she played football with you, and she would knock you out. Now I think she's got three or four kids. Yeah. Hello. So, so. We have this new way of raising children where it's like, well, just treat them like they're adults. They're not adults. Let, let them make their own decision, right? Let them make their own decision. And if they don't want to come to church, don't make them because you, you want them to serve God out of a love for God. Okay? Make them clean their room. Make them eat all their vegetables. Right? Let them just pick out whatever they want to wear, right? 15 degrees out, you're going to let them wear a bikini outside? Right? No. They need instruction. They need correction. And God said, you know what? You discipline them. I'll say this, you don't have to beat the blood out of them for everything. Brother Russell finally woke up. He's like, yeah, amen. But but here's what I want to say, and I'm done. All of us like that when it comes to our children. But we don't like it so much when it's God dealing with his children. We don't want God chastening us. But we expect obedience out of our children. If we expect obedience out of our children, why should we not expect God to expect it out of his? If we love a child, we correct the child. But if God loves us, he corrects us. And so with whatever discipline we believe is permissible for our children, why do we think, well, I'm an adult. So what? 
adults do dumb things. I'm, t- I'm talking to you adults too, right? I mean, let's be honest. We, we do some pretty, pretty foolish things ourselves. And so we look at it and say, well, you know, it's, that's good preaching right there, preacher. You know, you, can't, you can't, can't give wisdom to people that are foolish and they're not ready for it. But how often, even tonight, you're sitting here going, that's good for somebody else. That's right. Come on. But I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm where I want to be. Sometimes I don't think we realize how far away from God we really are. That's right, right. Amen. Brother Ron, we say, well, we want revival. We want God to do something. But see, we don't want change. We, we want the atmosphere of revival. Right. We want the results of yeah. it. But we don't want the repentance that comes along Amen. with it. And so we stay right where it's at. And we'll say, well, God's just not doing anything today. Maybe it's our condition. And so, as leaders, pastor, dads, moms, listen, older brothers, older sisters, teachers, whatever it is you are, you have to be the right kind of leader. And that leader is need to be aware of what's going on. I had a conversation with one of our local politicians this past week. And he said, well, this is coming up. And I want your support. I said, well, here's a problem. I said, I'm, I'm fed up with all of y'all. And I said, I'm, I'm sick of the whole peddling, we're behind you, we're behind you. And I said, you just look at, at what happened in the House. They just passed a $1.7 trillion spending bill. He said, well, that's federal. I'm talking about local. I said, no different local. Brother Bobby, I, I tried to get involved with them. I tried to influence and input but see all they wanted was sit at the table with me and we don't want anything you got to say but then when it's voting time get all your people to come vote for us so I just feel like till we start seeing some changes but look at your life And I bet you can look back and say, you know what? Here's a situation where my appetite got me in trouble. Here's a situation where someone was trying to impart wisdom, but I wouldn't listen. I can raise both hands and both feet and spend time telling you about more than that in my life. And we, we make excuses about, well, you know, one day, they'll one day. Let me say this, young person. If you want to avoid all the headaches and heartaches, the damage that can be done by Satan, right. you better get in under your parents, under your youth leader, under people that have wisdom, yeah. and listen what they got to say. Solomon is trying to help his son. And his son, I got this, Dad. I got it. I'm going to do it my way. Brother, we're not talking about some run-of-the-mill average dad. We're talking about the wisest man. And so if his kid wouldn't listen, dads, mom, don't beat yourself up when yours won't. But also don't be the one that won't listen to wisdom. See, it's always two two sides in it. It's this side we see who doesn't do it. But on this side we we see where we should do it. I don't know about you, but 
the longer I live, the more I'm unimpressed with this world. I won't go into detail. My wife let me buy some new undershirts this week. Matter of fact, she made me. I said, well, these, the ones I got, it's fine. She said, I got holes all in them. I said, but they're okay. I just don't care. I don't care about stuff anymore. Right. Amen. But man, there's time I did, man. I'm talking about the newest, and, but I don't, I just don't care. That's right. Amen. Stuff doesn't matter. I guess I'm getting closer. I hope that's not an indication I'm getting ready to go home soon. Amen. <laughs> I hope I got a few more days and years left in it. But, man, we're in the last days of the last days. And we've got too much to do to be sucked in by the devil. So be wise. Let's stand together. Let's bow our heads tonight. Miss Susan's going to come to the piano. Be aware. Amen. God spoke to your heart tonight. You come. If you're here, you've never trusted him as your savior. If you don't know for sure you'd go to heaven when you died, let me invite you to come. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message. I thank you for the sweet Holy Spirit of God to speak to our hearts tonight. And I pray that we would take what has been preached here tonight, what you've taught us through your word, and we would be wiser for it. Uh, we'd be aware of the traps that Satan has, and that, uh, Lord, we would flee from it, draw closer to you. Thank you again for your word. Thank you for loving us enough to give us the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.